History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 5, The Totality on the Road to Self-Realization, November 24th, 1964. You will remember that last time I tried to explain the concept of mediation with particular reference to the mediated relations between the universal and the particular in history. I did so with the aid of a brief discussion of the etiology of the French Revolution. I should now like to add something, a matter of fundamental importance, that I would ask you to take note of as a methodological or principled conclusion from the ideas we have been discussing. On the assumption that this entire line of thought does have some persuasive force in your eyes. What we have seen is that the historical construction of an event actually requires and presupposes the totality of elements, both their distinctiveness and their unity. My discussion of the French Revolution may well have been far too abstract and schematic, but if you follow my train of thought for a moment, you will realize that, once you take all the relevant factors into account, the philosophy of history merges with the writing of history. In other words, you can, you can really only do philosophy of history seriously if you enter into the subject matter of history itself, with all the nuances and distinctions that we struggled with last time. I recollect that I gave a course of lectures on the philosophy of history some years ago and felt very dissatisfied with it, even while I was giving it. Only later did I understand the cause of my dissatisfaction and that it arose from the problem I have just described to you. Needless to say, it is quite impossible to tackle any genuine historical topic, even in a very limited way, in the course of these lectures. Quite apart from the fact that I am no historian and would be able to make only very limited comment on historical subjects. But what I can do, and what I have tried to do, is to disentangle these various concrete factors in order to show you how intertwined they are. I have tried to show you how the philosophy of history, that is, the interpretation of historical events and the philosophical understanding of these events, not only presupposes historiography proper, but also moves in the direction of history writing in the process of explicating them. I should add that I make no claim to this discovery. You will find this theory already anticipated in Hegel. I have described the relevant aspects, which I refer to as the narrative aspects in part three of my little book on Hegel. That was my cat sneezing, you're welcome. As you might expect, there are also passages in Marx where he explicitly calls for the transi transition from the philosophy of history to historiography proper. Thus, it is important to realize that the philosophy of history does not fall outside the scope of historical research, but that the constellation of historical events, both as a whole and in detail, should, reg should regard itself as the philosophy of history proper. But the converse is all also true. By this I mean that philosophy should have the tendency to become history just as readily as history should become philosophy. I would like to emphasize the importance of this in our day, that is, in a situation in which, as I have repeatedly tried to show you, the world of facts has degenerated into a cloak, a veil that conceals what is essentially real. I may perhaps remind you of my own studies in music history. They deal with such topics as the relations between classic classicism, classicism? classicism, romanticism, and modernism, and they are intended to make the methodological point that we must try to overcome the sterile dichotomy between history and its philosophical interpretation. Those of you who have an inkling of what the word science meant to Hegel, and indeed to Fichte and Schelling before him, will understand what I am driving at. I know full, I know full well that what I am saying is at odds both with positivist epistemology and with current trends in the positivistic knowledge industry, but I am firmly convinced that this is the only viable approach. This means then that a history of literature that is not only that is not also philosophical history, 
In other words, a study that traces the development of literature in terms of its own conceptual nature would be entirely nugatory. In this connection, I would refer you to Walter Benjamin's Origins of the German Tragic Drama, and especially its epistemological preface, which develops a similar argument, though from a very different point of view. Having noted this by way of a preface, I would like to remind you that the abstract theorization of history from above is problematic because it fails to address the specific configurations of historical processes. I believe that I have given the idea of analyzing history from above its due, that is, the abstraction, the course of history in general, but it is a remarkable fact that if, as an observer of history, you simply go along with the flow of events, this ends up by committing you to giving your approval to whichever universal tendency happens to be gaining the upper hand. If I may again cite Benjamin in this context, you will turn out to be writing history from the point of view of the victors. Perhaps I can put it like this. When Hegel asserts that history is rational, we must not hypostasize the concept of rationality. We must not speak of rationality in itself. Rationality always has a terminus ad quem or to use a less highfalutin phrase, but also in Latin, it has a qui bono. Sui or sui bono? Qui bono. This means that history can be called rational only if we know for whom it is rational. If rationality, a concept based on an understanding of the self-preservation of the individual, ceases to have a human subject for whom it exists, it will lapse into a rationality the developments we witness today consist in no small degree of such a reversal of rationality into irrationality arising from the loss of this for someone. To put the situation in a more down-to-earth fashion, this means that the question whether history is in fact rational is a question about how it treats the individuals who have been caught up in the flow of events. We can really talk about the rationality of history only if it succeeds increasingly in satisfying the needs and interests of individuals, whether it be within general historical phases, or at least in its general trend. Hegel disagrees with this in principle when he states that the theatre of history is not the theatre of happiness. In so doing, Hegel hypostasizes rationality and falls in the, into the trap of thinking of rationality as the logic of things independently of their terminus ad quem in human beings the very thing he had expressly called for with his realist interpretation of the concept of reason. The rationality of the universal, then, if it is to be rational at all, cannot be an abstractly self-standing concept, but must consist in the relation of the universal to the particular. Now, as a logician, Hegel is very well aware of this, of this and is even responsible for the extreme statement, as I am sure many of you know, that the universal is only universal insofar as it is the particular, and that the reverse is likewise true. Thus, in a certain sense, Hegel's approach is one-sided because he writes his philosophical history from the standpoint of the victor, because he justifies or vindicates the universal as it asserts itself. In so doing, he ends up adopting a class standpoint that obscures the implications of his own principle. Despite the dialectic of universal and particular for which he made such a powerful case, his own theory of history ends up leaning towards the universal. The particular is not given the credit in particular that Hegel ascribes to it in general. If nevertheless we speak of idealism and Hegel, we do not mean just his metaphysical assumptions, such as the absolute subject or absolute identity but rather the fact that the universal, which is always a concept, an idea contrasted with the particular, ends up lording it over the particular. For all the talk of a dialectic between universal and particular, it is the universal that is declared the true reality. We see here a contradiction, a non-dialectical contradiction in Hegel's philosophy. On the one hand, he calls for the dialectic of universal and particular, and actually carries this through quite magnificently in many respects. But then he fails to take the particular quite so seriously and constantly threatens to go over to the side of the universal, if I may put it that way, so that the consciousness of non-identity which characterizes the particular is stripped of its own substantiality 
and survives only as suffering, as a consciousness of pain. Instead of concluding that what we have is a state of non-reconciliation, he behaves a little like a senior church official or a judge, at any rate like some high up bureaucrat or other, who sees only the limited outlook of the lower orders who are unable to recognize the higher meaning in all of this. He is not deterred in this by the consideration that it is unreasonable to ask the victim, the individual who has to put up with the consequences, to find comfort in the circumstance that the irreconcilable principle of the way of the world sh should govern his own private fate. I should perhaps draw your attention to a methodological point here. Unlike the young Marx in his criticism of the philosophy of right, and I too have of course chiefly had the philosophy of right in mind here, the critical point I am making now is intrinsic to Hegel's own argument. That is to say, I am not proposing any yardstick other than to demand that he really follows through with the implications of the dialectic of universal, and particular, that he has himself proposed. In short, in the belief that he has rightly claimed that this dialectic is the only appropriate method, I wish to judge him according to his own criteria. Having fired off this broadside at Hegel, military figures of speech tend to spring to mind when speaking... When speaking... Oh, fuck. When speaking of the philosophy of right, I should now like to add a few w words in defense of Hegel. I am sorry if you find it confusing for me to set about obscuring a distinction that I have only just clarified, but it cannot be my, my task to make difficult any complex matters um, appear simpler. To make difficult and complex matters appear simpler than they are merely from a desire to present everything to you in easily digestible form. The task of thought is to attempt to present this complexity to you in as precise a way as possible, even when the matter in hand is extremely difficult and complex. To put it in aesthetic terms, my aim is to present what is vague in a conceptually clear f shape. The point I wish to make is that Hegel's mistake or his inconsistency, and my hope is that by now you will have grasped, grasped where the mistake lies, has a certain justification. Perhaps you will recollect that, as I have suggested several times, the Hegelian program paradoxically has a positivist side, in the sense that he tries to fit in, that he would like to adapt himself to the world as it is, and that he assumes the identity of what exists with the spirit, the whole of idealism in fact. But what this amounts to in the first instance, and, and I would ask you to set aside these admittedly gigantic assumptions for the moment, and the more gigantic they are, the more it is to be recommended that they be set aside, is that he quite straightforwardly wishes to be guided by things as they are, by what he sees before him. Now what makes the problem so complicated is that the reality is, and this is hopefully not too stale a conclusion to be drawn from our discussion of the French Revolution, that the supremacy of the universal, the preponderance of the universal that is then deified by Hegel, does in fact, as the actual historical power, emerge as the stronger. As long as Hegel simply theorizes the course of the world as it is by asserting that the universal takes precedence over the particular, he is, to put it quite crudely, a realist. This is the way the world is. He proceeds, therefore, in the opposite direction to that taken by nominalism. Nominalism believes that the universal is no more than a conclusion arising from the countless particularities which are then brought together in a single concept. And Hegel was incredibly sensitive to this, to what he calls the course of the world. If anything about him was realistic, it was precisely his responsiveness to this dominance of the universal in the realm of realities, the so-called facts. The only delusion lies in the way that he interprets this primacy of the universal, this actual primacy of the concept, as if it meant the world itself were concept, spirit, and therefore good. Admittedly, he is in tune here with the main current of Western philosophy in which, ever since Plato, the universal, the necessary, unity, and the good are all identified with one another. And here I have reached the point where it becomes clear that, even though they are highly innovative, Hegel's philosophy of history and his construction of dialectics really belong to traditional theory. They remain imprisoned in a platonic framework. 
Once reason, and this is the counter position I am attempting to present to you in these lectures, once reason has lost its relation to the individuals who are concerned with self-preservation, it degenerates into unreason. And this reversal takes place objectively in Hegel, but it is not a change that the, he that the Hegelian dialectic has made explicit. Moreover, this is an idealist tendency that goes far beyond Hegel himself. The identification with the universal enters deeply into the fiber of Marxism, notwithstanding the much cruder epistemological positions of Marx and the Marxists. For there you find something like the belief that, when ultimately the universal takes over and the concept is victorious, individuals will indeed come into their own. And this factor will ensure that all the suffering and the wasted individuality of history will somehow be made good. This is an issue that, to the best of my knowledge, was first commented on critically by Ivan Turgenev in the 19th century. Turgenev maintained that even the prospect of a completely classless society could not console him for the fate of all those who had suffered to no purpose and had fallen by the wayside. I have already said that when the concept of reason becomes abstract, when it becomes separated from individual interests craving fulfillment, it turns into unreason. However, you should try not to think of this change as pointing to the decadence of philosophy, of the philosophy of history, because here too there is not without cause, and it is a process with deep underlying causes. In all probability, we shall only be armed intellectually, philo philosophically, to withstand this tendency, if we think of this not as a corrigible error, but as a necessity. For the fact is that a genuine reality underlies Hegel's defense of what absolute reason that comes to understand itself. We might say that his hypostasization is the hypostasization of mankind as a species. It is the species that maintains itself as a whole, as against the claims of individuals who are concerned with preserving themselves. For the principle of self-preservation is itself irrational in particular, if it is restricted to individuals, to the particular individual rationality of individuals. The great bourgeois thinkers from Hobbes to Kant have always taken care to point this out. I mention these two names in particular because it shows you very clearly the beginning and the end of this idea. It is therefore part of the logic of the self-preservation of the individual that it should be extended to embrace the conception of the self-preservation of the species. But that is also the problem. It is not a problem I would, I would claim to be able to solve for you. I have hiccups all of a sudden. But I should at least like to make you aware of it, since it seems to me to be a matter of extraordinary difficulty and gravity. It consists in this, because the self-preserving reason of the individual is converted into the self-preservation of the species. There is an intrinsic temptation for this universality to emancipate itself from the individuals it comprises. Kant himself had noted in his theory of right that the universal freedom of all should have restrictions placed on it insofar as it, it, as it called for the freedom of each individual from every other. Thus, the idea of species reason, that is, the form of reason that comes to prevail universally, already contains by virtue of its universality an element restricting the individual, and in certain circumstances this element can develop in such a way as to turn into an injustice, on the part of the universal towards the particular, and hence in turn to the predominance of particularity. Thus, on the one side, reason can liberate itself from the particularity of obdurate particular interest, but on the other side, fail to free itself from the no less obdurate particular interest of the totality. How this problem is to be resolved is a conundrum that philosophy has failed to answer hith hitherto. Even worse, it is a problem which the organization of the human race has also failed to solve. It is for this reason that I do not think I am exaggerating when I say that it is a problem of the greatest possible gravity. This is probably connected with the fact that the concept of the species automatically involves the idea of the domination of nature. And this means, if I may borrow an expression from my friend Horkheimer, that the, that the constitution of humanity as a species amounts to a gigantic public company for the exploitation of nature, without involving much alteration in the idea of particularity. In all probability, we would have to reflect far more deeply about the principle underlying reason 
namely the principle of self-preservation. If we are to make much progress beyond the simple idea of gathering everything up in the notion of species, we may add a further point regarding that quite logical and consistent perversion of universality, which involves the idea of the whole as opposed to the particular, while simultaneously converting the whole into a particular. We may point out that this perverse conclusion is that is what triumphed in fascist race theory, according to which this universality was twisted into a natural relation, naturalized and thereby turned into a particular. Then, like all particulars, this one became increasingly intolerant of other particulars, choosing instead to beat the life out of them whenever possible. This will remain, or sorry, this will perhaps explain to you why the dialectic of reason or the dialectic of enlightenment is a matter of such profound importance in history, so much so that we must conclude, and I perhaps exaggerate in order to make the point, that in the historical form in which we encounter it to this day, reason is both reason and unreason in one. The concept of the primacy of reason contains the idea that reason has the task of taming, suppressing, ordering, and governing whatever is unreasonable, instead of absorbing it into itself in a spirit of reconciliation. Thus, this notion of reason as domination is inherent in the concept of reason from its inception, and the idea of conflict is implicit in it from the outset. Accordingly, we should not be too surprised if conflict continues to reproduce itself through reason. That is, if reason continues to flip over into unreason. The more powerful the world's spirit is, and it has never been as powerful as it is today, when we have all been reduced to the status of its agents. The more powerful the world spirit is, the more we are justified in doubting whether the world spirit really is the world spirit, rather than its opposite. This leads us to conclude that the primacy of the totality in history represents anything but the victory of the idea. We could formulate it like that, or alternatively we might say, as I have already indicated, that the world spirit exists as the universal that comes to prevail, but that it is no world spirit, that it is not spirit, but that for the most part it is the negativity that Hegel had shifted from the universal to its victims, to what he refers to as worthless existence, to mere individuality. We can find evidence in the great philosophies of spirit to support our belief in the dubious nature of the concept of spirit at the very point where it becomes so inflated that it identifies itself with the totality, where it lays claim to the totality. The evidence is so powerful that I would like to, com to commend it to you. Far from encouraging, requiring, and stimulating spirit to become a real force in the world, this philosophy of absolute spirit displays an almost universal tendency to discourage everything one might think of as spirit in a concrete sense namely the ability of individuals to reflect, to understand, and to criticize. This tendency started as far back as Kant, in whose writings the idea was first postulated. This disparaging view of the individual consciousness can be found in countless passages in Kant, for example, where he defends the categorical imperative against individual critical voices. You will also have seen the same tendency at work in Hegel's diatribes against reformers and intellectuals. You will find it in all the passages where he makes short work a priory of all criticism, that is, every concrete expression of what could be thought of as spirit, in the name of an allegedly higher conception of spirit, without it's even occurring to him for a moment that this allegedly higher conception of spirit still has to prove its worth before the tribunal of the actual living spirit of mankind. Furthermore, you will also find in Hegel that appalling academic rancor towards anything clever and witty, in other words, towards those who know how to write. Later on, during the decline of German universities, this became the veritable signature of the spirit of so-called science, the so-called human sciences. So when we hear what Hegel had to say about certain representatives of the Enlightenment who, like Diderot, for example, were just too clever, it is altogether too painful to read. We are thus contemplating a philosophy that on the one hand elevates itself to the plane of the absolute, while on the other shows signs of nerves as soon as it encounters a clever and witty thinker. Such a philosophy renders itself highly suspect, and may be that a well-informed Hegelian, incidentally I think of myself as being fairly well-informed about Hegel, 
will repost that the spirit that Hegel was talking about and the spirit that Diderot really had are two very different things. But I would reply to any such well-informed person that the two things are not so different as all that. For if all links are broken between the living, critical spirit of the individual whose mind penetrates reality in the absolute spirit, which is said to be in the process of realizing itself, between spirit as imagination, as a constructive and perspicacious faculty, and spirit as the world spirit that is coming to prevail objectively in the world, then spirit will rightly come under suspicion of turning into the ideology of its own absence. It will be comparable to that bourgeois tendency, or indeed that of class society as such, to elevate women into an object of worship, to speak of women as the eternal feminine that draws us onward, or as does Schiller, as creatures who plate and weave in God's name, but at the same time to treat women in reality as minors and to hold them in permanent subjection. And this analogy between the role of spirit and that of women is not as arbitrary and formal as may appear at first sight. The transfiguration of spirit, however, and I am trying to be as fair-minded as possible, the transfiguration of spirit about which I have now told you enough comprising things, or compromising things, this transfiguration of the totality was only possible because the human race, in fact, can only survive in and through the, to the totality. The only reason why the optimism of the, of the philosophy of absolute spirit is not a mere mockery is because the essence of all the self-preserving acts that culminate in this supreme concept of reason, as absolute self-preservation is after all the means by which humanity has managed to survive and still continues to do so. And it has succeeded in doing so despite all the suffering, the terrible grinding of the machinery and the sacrifices of what Marx would, call, would have called the forces and means of production. The infinite weak point of every critical position, and I would like to tell you that I include my own here, is that when confronted with such criticism, Hegel simply has the more powerful argument. This is because there is no other world that, than the one which we live, or at least we have no reliable knowledge of any alternative despite all our radar screens and giant radio telescopes. So that we shall always be told, everything you are, everything you have, you owe. We owe to this odious totality, even though we cannot deny that it is an odious and abhorrent, and abhorrent totality. I believe that you can only understand the violence inherent in this view of history as a self-realizing totality if you understand that its truth, its almost irresistible truth, lies in the fact that life, and with it the possibility of happiness, and indeed even the possibility of a differently constituted world, would be inconceivable without all the things that can be urged by way of objection to it, its failings towards the individual and all its senseless suffering and cruelty. And I would say that if you wish to go beyond seeing the theory of history as absolute spirit, as more than a complementary ideology, more than a piece of justification of the kind that I believe I have been able to show you without any whitewashing, then you will very definitely have to include this factor that I have just been outlining to you but I should like to say a few more words on this subject next time.